there's a steady, gentle rain outside. It's a good night to be inside. Not only inside a warm building, but inside your body. You don't have to pay any attention to anything outside. You can let the Dharma talk just be in the background. You want to focus in on your breath. Work on your Dhamma wheel inside. It's December 12th, 12th day of the 12th month. It's a good day to chant the, the Dhamma Chaka, because the Dharma wheel has 12 spokes. You may have noticed that passage where the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths, and there are three levels of knowledge with regard to each truth. And it goes down the list. The truth of suffering, which is not that life is suffering. I've said it many times in the past, but I keep hearing people say that life is suffering. It's not the case that the Buddha said life is suffering, it's that there is suffering. And he identifies it as the five clinging aggregates. So you know what suffering is, and the next thing to know is what to do with it. And that's supposed to be comprehended. You want to comprehend what the clinging is there. And when you get to the point where you finally have comprehended it, that's the third level of knowledge. You realize you've completed the task. Again, it's not that you've just comprehended it once. You've comprehended it all the way through. Then there's the next noble truth. The origination of suffering. What causes it? And that's craving. Craving based on ignorance. So once you know what it is, then the next question is, what do you do with it? You try to abandon it. Once you see the craving in action, you just drop it. And you'll be dropping it many times and been picking it up again many times until finally you've thoroughly comprehended suffering and stress. That's when you can totally abandon the craving. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering and stress. And it's just that. It's the abandoning of the craving. And that's something you want to realize. So there are two things happening here. You're abandoning the craving and you're realizing what you're doing. You're realizing the results that come. And you want to get to the point where you've totally abandoned everything. And then finally, there's the, the path, the practice to the end of suffering. It's a Noble Eightfold Path. And the duty there is to develop it. It's the second level of knowledge, just knowing the fact that that's the duty. And then third, when you've totally developed all the factors, that's when you completed that. Those are the twelve spokes of the Dharma Wheel, and they all converge on knowledge of things as they've come to be. Which is the knowledge of awakening. In other words, you see things as they've come to be, and then you see what's beyond becoming into being. So that's the wheel. And as the title of the talk tells you, and as the Devas said afterwards, this was set in motion. We've got the Dharma wheel on the the wall up there. If we really wanted to, to depict the Dharma wheel, we'd have to put a little motor in to keep it in motion. Because the Dharma wheel keeps spinning. And as the Deva said, nobody can stop it. It just keeps spinning and spinning. And the, the image of the wheel also means that it's an image of power. The Buddha's teaching totally overcomes all other teachings because it deals with the most important problem, and it deals effectively with it, the problem of suffering and how to put an end to it. And you notice there are shoulds all the way through. There's a duty to be done with each of them. That's a should right there. And then with that path, there are right factors, and their opposite is wrong factors. Sometimes you hear the word samma, right translate in ways that tries to avoid the fact that it actually means right. It's like a harmonious view or a, a highest view. Or, but the opposite of samma in Pali is micha, which very clearly means wrong. 
the Buddha is saying there's a right view and there's a wrong view. There's a right resolve and there's a wrong resolve. And even before he gets to the, the topic of what should be done with these things, and what's right and what's wrong about them, he even starts his talk out by saying there's a wrong way of doing things. Again, there's a very clear sense of what should and shouldn't be done. He says you should avoid those two extremes of sensual indulgence and self-torture. This is a common pattern throughout the Buddha's teachings. Before he tells you what the right way to do things is, he's going to make sure you realize that certain ways of doing things are wrong. His very first sentence in his teaching career was talking about two wrong ways of practicing and what's wrong about them. And as he said later, explaining non-dhamma as non-dhamma, in other words, things that are opposed to the dharma as clearly being opposed to the dharma, that's a very meritorious act. Because it helps clear the air. Otherwise, people take their old presuppositions and then just kind of meld them together with what's being said, what's being taught, and it gets confusing. Years back, after I've been giving retreats in Laguna for years, one person came up and said, You know, I think I'm finally hearing what you're saying. And she repeated basically what I've been saying all day and I've been saying in many of the previous retreats. And I said, Yep. He said, it's only today that I've heard it. And I realized that she'd come from another school of Buddhism, and I just kind of melded what I was saying together, what she'd heard before. And where, wherever it didn't fit in, she just assumed that maybe I wasn't articulate enough or whatever. So the message just went right past her. It's very important when to know the Dharma, you also have to know what's not Dharma. The Buddha was not the sort of person who said everything is non-dual and there's no right and wrong. There are very definitely wrong ways to practice, wrong ways to see things, because they get in the way of putting that into suffering. Only certain things work. His own analogy is trying to get milk out of a cow. If you try to twist the horn, it's the wrong way to do it. You have to pull out the udder. That's the right way. Now, some people have been twisting at the horn, twisting the horn, finally just give up and they say, Oh, I feel so much better not to be twisting the horn anymore. Maybe I should just not have any effort at all. Which is better than twisting the horn. But still, you still don't get the milk. There are very definite shoulds and should nots here. The shoulds, of course, are conditional on your wanting to put an end to suffering. That's what keeps, though, the Dharma wheel moving, is that desire to put an end to suffering in the hopes that maybe this will do it. As is the Deva said, no Mara or Brahma or Deva or anybody in the world can put an end to the rolling of the Dharma wheel. But there are a lot of people who try. They want to convince us that when we don't really have good records of what the Buddha said, or maybe the Buddha didn't even teach the Four Noble Truths, or maybe taught something else, and he was misrepresented. The people with degrees telling us this. They're trying their hardest to put logs in the spokes so the wheel stops turning. What keeps the wheel turning is the fact that there are people who want to put an end to suffering. They want to give this a chance. So is the Dharma wheel rolling in your own heart? Look inside. Do you have all the spokes yet? Do you have any of the spokes? As long as you understand what the truths are and what the duties with, with regard to them are, you've got eight spokes right there. The, what remains is getting those last four completing the work in each case, because it's in completing each of the tasks that all the tasks get done. They come together and they converge right there at the hub. Ajahn Cha talks about how when Ajahn Mun and Ajahn Sa were first getting known in the Northeast, it stirred up a lot of controversy. Because they were saying very definitely that the things that people had been doing for a long, long time were not in line with what the Buddha taught. 
families would get divided over who they should support, who they should believe. And you might say, well, it would be nicer to let everybody be peaceful and say everybody's right, but that doesn't solve the problem of suffering. You can say, okay, anybody who wants to twist the horn can go ahead and twist the horn, and anybody who wants to pull the otter can pull the otter, and anybody who just wants to sit back and not do anything, that's perfectly fine. That way we can live in peace. But things get confused. You get different results from different actions, which is why some actions are right in terms of putting an end to suffering and stress, and though some actions are wrong. When we look at the Buddha's teaching career, very often he would start out and say, this is wrong, and then tell you what's right, and you'd have to decide. Are you going to go with him? You have to make a choice. It is either or. And as he said, any harmony that's not based on the Dharma is not true harmony. Or if there's any controversy among members of the Sangha, monks, as to what's the right way to interpret a certain passage or what's the, what exactly the passage was, what did the Buddha teach on a t particular topic, he said you get everybody voting to change things and it still wouldn't be right. It would be invalidated by the fact that it was opposed to the Dharma. So it's not something to be changed, it's something to be tested. If you change it, then you deny other people the, the opportunity to test it. And you deny yourself the opportunity to test it. So this is the Dharma wheel that shook the world when the Buddha first taught it. And it does shake things up. It asks people to ask new questions. What are they doing that's causing suffering? Because all too often the suffering is something we blame on somebody else. We're not being treated with proper respect. We're not being whatever. But the Buddha said, look inside. The problem is coming from within, and it can be solved from within. So he's asking you to make choices. There are people who would rather not have any shoulds placed on them. And again, the Buddha's not placing them on you, but he's saying, if you really want to put it into suffering, that's what's pushing you. The fact that you've got suffering and you want to have an end to it. And he's giving you the choice. Do you want to end it this way? Or do you not want to end it at all? Because this is the way to do it. So there's an either or. There's a right and there's a wrong. There's a should and a should not. That's why when this wheel was set into motion, the world quaked. Not only the world, but everything in the universe quaked, they say, all the way up to the Brahma worlds. Because it's opening a real possibility to get out of this continued wandering around through suffering. It shakes the very basis of all levels of becoming. And so it's up to each of us to see if we want to keep that drama rolling in our hearts. And see what gets shaken up in the process. <laughs>